I have medicine. Antibiotics. Maybe she can help. It's so bizarre doing a movie like this. Anytime you have a scene with an ape, you're basically acting to a man or a woman in a gray unitard, you know, with these white dots all over them, making ape noises and crouching like an ape. One day. I was worried. I was like, Matt, what is this gonna be? What is this gonna be? Is this gonna be someone acting like an ape? What are we gonna be doing? And I had a friend, actually, who had worked with Andy Serkis. He said, don't worry, you'll be fine. You stay one day. And you know what? Instantly, he is so good. You might need a little more time. One day! Maybe when I come back, maybe it's like a moment just to try and breathe. As I, as I come back, I might turn around and come back this way as if we're heading out. Yes. I think that's the best chance we have at it. I agree with you. Yeah. I remember when I first came on, I wanted to understand motion capture because I'd never done it. So I asked all of the VFX people to show me the performances of Andy and then show me Caesar so I could understand how they got from here to there. And of course, I'd already been blown away by what I saw, what I saw of Caesar. But when I looked at the footage, I was even more blown away by Andy. The emotional qualities which he gives Caesar that's why the audience loved Rise that much. I mean, it was a good movie, but what it really was was a great performance in Caesar with Andy Serkis. And he's doing that here in Dawn. He has the load of this narrative. All of the pressure falls on Caesar. Everybody's looking to Caesar for the answers. The big challenge for finding Caesar this time around was plugging into exactly where he is emotionally, where he is psychologically. So I had to do a lot of thinking as to what had happened in that 10 year period. When I approached Caesar originally, I felt that Caesar was almost a human being trapped in an ape's body. That's how I approached him physically. And then when we came into this movie, he really had to find his inner ape and grow to respect those things and to access those things and bury, really, most of the, the humanity that's in him. As I say, apart from the things that he decides that can be used to support the things he wants to bring to the apes, knowledge and equality. So that was really the basis of, of, of where I started for creating Caesar for the second movie. The amazing thing about the way Andy interprets Caesar is that his instincts are almost universally better than what we would have been able to dictate from the script. There's lots of moments in the script where obviously we need to explain what we want Caesar to be doing behaviorally, really because we're trying to limit how much he's doing with dialogue or signing. So that kind of behavior, we try to make it very specific and we try to make it seem realistic, but also at the same time feel a bit evolved. And Andy is gifted beyond belief at doing that kind of thing. Truthfully, it's almost a bit of a crutch because there are times where we'll work on stuff and at some point we'll just assume Andy will pull this off. It might seem a little bit insane on the page, but I bet Andy will be able to pull it off and, and sell you know, what's going on here. Sir, no guns. He's a pacifist. So he has to weigh up the dangers that the entire colony could face if they start to retaliate for the invasion. And so, really, the middle act of the film becomes about Caesar trying to negotiate and also work with the human beings, particularly one human being, Malcolm, played by Jason Clarke. This is your home, and I don't want to take it away from you, I promise. But if you can allow us, let us do our work here. You brought others. This is part of the conflict for Caesar. Bizarrely, there's one human being who seems to understand the ape colony and isn't prejudiced against apes, but he's very open-minded and thinks that they can work together. I'm not a threat. If I am, then I guess you can kill me. You have us serve humans. Humans should serve apes. You shame apes. Shame your son. Andy's been the most influential for me on this. He's such a nurturing dude without ever letting you know that you brought under his... It's not a favor he's doing you. Hey, I'm gonna teach you something. 
I learn from watching, but he's very disciplined and he doesn't like really to waste time because he sees no purpose in it. And so he's got that great balance of like a, a true man, you know, like great performer. <laughs> People work in different ways, but you know, people think that it's a matter of doing monkey movements, that it's a matter of copying a chimpanzee, or you know, it's nothing to do with that really. I mean, yes, there are behavioral things that you have to learn, but actually, it's all about you playing a character, regardless of playing an ape. It's understanding the psychology of the part as you would if you were playing a human being. So, you know, performance capture isn't about you know sort of doing gross body movements and pantomiming. It's, it's, it's actually where it's at its most powerful is in its stillness. You know, being brave enough to hold a close-up and to internalize and not feel you're having to demonstrate your apeness. It's a very complex thing in a way that we do because you're not working in a big suit, a big furry suit. So it's not about the external of it. It's, a, it's much, much more about the internalization of it. It's so interesting because people, I think, assume that the performance capture process is going to be alienating to an actor who's playing a live action character. But actually, I think they just forget after about five minutes. Once you get over looking into my face when I've got lots of dots all over it and a head mounted camera, once you've literally been in that situation for five minutes and it meant nothing because actors are actors and they look into each other's eyes and they know whether the other person's being truthful or not and that's what all of this is about. See, so if you don't go, it'll be all how war. War has already begun. As the ape fight is going on, Caesar finds himself with Cobra beneath him, about to drop to his death. And Cobra uses the one tenet of belief, more important than anything else, to try and save his own life. Ape, not kill. Ape. And Caesar has to make a decision, and he has to do what he believes is right, which is to let him drop to his death. I remember when I read it for the first time, I thought it was so wrong for the character of Caesar to do that. And I had a very violent reaction to it. And actually having played the role all the way through and reached a point where it actually began to make sense, but it was a very complicated scenario. And any kind of absolute belief system is, is fundamentally flawed. And I think that for Caesar, because humans have let the earth fall apart, in his ambition to make a perfect ape society. He believed that apes could make a, a better job of it than humans. And actually that is his central flaw because Cobra is the living example of an ape who's gone completely against that. Apes follow Cobra now. And Malcolm is a living example of a human being who is exemplary in his attitude and in his altruism, really. Put your guns down. I always think ape better than human. That's his journey, and that's the thing that he has to realize. And, um, and it's a very bittersweet sort of lesson for him. I see now. Like them we are. 